Hello everybody, it's been a while since I made my last video, but today I felt inspired to talk to you for a little while about Leo Strauss, neoconservatism, and noble lies. The cause of this reflection, as you probably can guess, is the fact that the Weekly Standard was just shut down. The Weekly Standard, an American journal of neoconservative orientation, affiliated with, as you know, Bill Kristol, who some people see as, together with other neoconservatives, um, an important architect of the American invasion of Iraq. And if you read some analyses of Kristol and neoconservatives in the Iraq war, eventually you'll hear the name Leo Strauss, uh, a German emigre to America, a scholar of the history of political philosophy, who will be accused of being the secret Wizard of Oz behind the curtain puppet master controlling the rest of these neoconservatives, or at least the major source of their ideas about the need to lie to the public to accomplish your political aims. An idea they say is a image of the noble lie that Strauss learned from Plato and taught his students to perpetuate. So the American war against Iraq was based on lies. Those were the lies of Strauss's students, the neoconservatives, who thought the lies were noble and inflicted them upon the American public for the sake of some other aim. Maybe to support Israel, since neocons are Jewish Zionists. I'm stating the view of the people, obviously, who are critical of this school. Um, or for some other reason. Well, there's more to the story than that. And in this video, I want to give you a different perspective on Strauss and the noble lie. I have to give you a few disclaimers though. The first disclaimer is that I am, I once considered myself a neoconservative, although I wouldn't say that I do so now. One of the main reasons I identified with neoconservatism was because I had heard about the influence that Strauss had on neoconservative figures. And having a great deal of admiration for Strauss's scholarship, I thought how wonderful it is that there's a school of political ideology that also esteems him and that therefore it felt like a natural home for me. As you know from my other videos, I'm also a Zionist in the sense that I support political statehood for the Jewish people. And since neoconservatives tended to be favorably predisposed toward the existence of Israel vis-a-vis -vis those people who are not so disposed, that was another reason I felt at home among neoconservatives. I have to add that I have met Bill Kristol um, at a workshop, a three-day workshop on the topic of liberalism, conservatism, and the Jews, where basically the question was, why do Jews tend to vote democratic as often as they do? And why are Jewish moral principles and values so often collapsed to liberal moral values so that people take Judaism and liberalism as practically synonymous. When there's so much evidence to suggest that Jewish thought is inherently conservative. So that was a great workshop uh, led by Bill Kristol. And incidentally, that was where I first pitched the idea of Zionism and the fourth political theory. I've been a neoconservative. I have met and like neoconservatives. I'm a great admirer of Leo Strauss, um, but there are problems too. So I draw a distinction between Strauss and Straussians, those people who studied with Strauss and went to establish their own cliques and schools of thought um, in light of what they understood of Strauss. I've had problems with them. I think I'm probably blacklisted by many of them um, because I'm more sympathetic to German conservative thought, Heidegger, Schmidt, and so on, than they are. Uh, and I believe that Strauss was a defender of education and not of the indoctrination of students into the principles of the regime merely. So... What about the noble lie? Well, I'm about to tell you about the noble lie. The noble lie. The short version of it that you'll hear if you read anti-Strauss propaganda as I mentioned to you already, is that Strauss taught his students that there, that there exists an intellectual elite, a small intellectual elite, and the large, vulgar, unwashed masses 
who are incapable of understanding a truth if it hits them in the face. And that to protect themselves against the masses, the intellectual elite sometimes must lie to the people. And the most egregious case of an elite lying to the people, in the popular opinion about Leo Strauss, is that his neoconservative students lied about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq as a pretense for invasion of that country. Now... I am not here to defend the Iraq war, which was a mistake. And I'm not here to defend all of the neoconservative thinkers who are accused of having lied for the sake of that war. Rather, I wanted to talk to you for a minute about a more philosophical meaning of the noble lie as it occurs in Strauss's own work, independently of how we may have been interpreted by so-called Straussians. I've been listening to Strauss's lectures on the Apology of Socrates, that dialogue of Plato's in which Socrates is presented as giving his defense speech in front of the Athenian jury that has accused him of corrupting the youth and not believing in the gods of the city. As you know, if you know anything about the life of Socrates, he was found guilty of these charges, which merited capital punishment, and he was sentenced to death by poisoning. Thus ends the story of Socrates' life. Of course, there's a dialogue called the Crito, which depicts Socrates in jail, having a conversation with some of his close friends, one of whom is trying to persuade him to run away and break out of jail. So these two dialogues, the Apology, Socrates' defense speech, at which he's found guilty, and the Crito, depiction of his last, uh, last days and last hours, belong together, And Strauss's lecture um, on them combines them, discusses them both. Now, in the course of that lecture, Strauss makes the remark that Plato depicts Socrates or has Socrates say about his own life something that is not true when measured against the depiction of Socrates' life in the rest of Plato's writings. Plato a man of incredible insight, intelligence, and um, genius, dedicated his gifts to the depiction of the life of Socrates. An incredible vote of confidence in the importance of that man's life and significance. So when you read about the life of Socrates in Plato, as Strauss did for so many decades, you are aware in a way that a beginner would not be of the mismatch between what Socrates says about himself in his defense speech before the city and how he actually lived his life. Without going into every detail, after all, the course itself is many, many hours long, whereas this video is going to be rather short. Socrates is depicted in the Apology as being a gadfly. A gadfly. Many of you who have heard his name may have heard that term applied to him. He's an annoying little creature who bites at the body politic, uh, constantly trying to spur it into moral self-improvement. So as Strauss says in his lecture, people have the impression which Plato gave them in this work That Socrates went around like an Uncle Sam saying, I want you, Mr. or Miss Athenian, to ask yourself, have you improved morally today? Have you reflected on your activities today? Have you examined yourself today? Whereas the Socrates that is depicted in the rest of the Platonic corpus, the rest of Plato's works about Socrates, Do not show a man who's constantly walking around the marketplace asking ordinary Athenians to examine themselves morally. He's not a street epistemologist or anything like that. In fact, he has conversations out of the public eye, not with many, but with a few people. 
Not always willingly, sometimes out of compulsion. But he's very different than the man of the marketplace depicted in the Apology. Now, what Strauss says is that Plato is therefore lying about Socrates' life and Socrates' practice in the Apology. It is a lie that Socrates walked around the marketplace speaking to every man about his moral improvement. All right. Well, what makes that a noble lie? If the neoconservatives are thought to have lied for the sake of invasion of another country, for the sake of imperial greatness, for the sake of Israel, or for whatever other reason they're accused of having lied to the American people, maybe just for the oil wells or something like that, Plato's lie on behalf of Socrates is of a completely different character. And we don't understand Strauss's teaching about the noble lie unless we understand the precise meaning of the nobility of Plato's lie about Socrates. I admit it has something to do with a so-called intellectual elite and the masses, although those terms are wholly inadequate to capture the true contours of the conflict. In fact, this problem is equivalent for Strauss to the problem of Socrates' irony. In the same lecture, Socrates, I mean Strauss, says what Socrates' irony consists of. It is a pretending to be more ignorant or less wise than one is. Because that's what's called for by one's audience or one's interlocutors. So Socrates' irony is that he's wise in many things, but that he feigns ignorance or pretends not to be wise, not for the satisfaction of doing that, not because he's um, a tricky little um, trickster, but because he tailors his speech to the capacities of his audience. A perfectly sensible thing for an educator to do. Can you imagine a math teacher or a music teacher who spoke above the heads of a pupil in the course of their education? How effective would such an education be? Of course, you can imagine the ideal educator is the one who can meet each student exactly where they are, who can meet each student exactly where they are, take them where they must go in the course of their education, do so ably and effectively in each instance. Well, what is the relationship between Socrates' irony, understood in this sense, and Plato's lying, nobly, about Socrates' life? Remember that the charge Socrates faced in the Apology was corrupting the youth and not believing in the gods that the city believes in. Strauss extrapolated this notion of not believing in the gods that the city believes in, I would say, to the view that every city or every regime has its own gods, axioms, ideological givens that cannot be doubted without putting yourself in some peril. The corruption of the youth had something to do with Socrates' ability to elevate some of his students beyond the constraining horizons of the political ideology or the gods of the city. Students who were not fit for such elevation, Socrates, of course, would not go out of his way to speak to in the same manner as he would speak to students of more promise. Well, if men of Athens, those who are addressed in the Apology of Socrates, are to come to believe that philosophy has the dangerous effect of undermining the city's beliefs, 
and the dangerous effect of winning over young, impressionable men to a way of life that exceeds the life of obedience to the gods of the city. Surely you can see why they would perceive Socrates as a menace and as a threat. Plato presents Socrates in the Apology and in the rest of his writings as a man who provides the city at large with a moral benefit, showing the positive effect that philosophy can have on the political community. Philosophy has the potential to point out vices, to point the way towards virtues, to provide an analysis of human excellences, and overall to establish patterns of sound judgment and moderate behavior, moderation. Philosophy also has the potential to lead the young puppies of the philosophical race, as Socrates, I mean, as Strauss puts it, to a higher life of contemplation, a life that cannot be bound, ultimately, by any political horizon. So, in Strauss, the noble lie has primarily a philosophical purpose. A philosophical purpose. It is a presentation of the political life that is somewhat one-sided because that is what is demanded by the capacity of the audience. It is an ironical presentation of philosophy as primarily a matter of moral improvement. That's a lie, not because philosophy is not concerned with moral improvement, but because philosophy is not primarily concerned with moral improvement for Socrates, but rather it is primarily concerned with speculative contemplation, theoretical inquiry into fundamentals, and the search, if not the search for, if not the ultimate possession of, Wisdom. When you think of Leo Strauss, neoconservatives, and the noble lie, you must therefore disambiguate slightly between lies that have a political purpose for a political end, conquest, invasion, enrichment, and so on, and lies that are noble because they serve the nobility of man's contemplative activity. The true Strauss, the Socratic Strauss, is the Strauss of the life of contemplation. Thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, please subscribe to my channel and watch my other videos. Comment below. I'm happy to answer most questions. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.